Chapter Eighteen of Oliver Twist. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter Eighteen. How Oliver passed his time in the improving society of his reputable friends. About noon next day, when the Dodger and Master Bates had gone out to pursue their customary avocations. Mr. Fagin took the opportunity of reading Oliver a long lecture on the crying sin of ingratitude, of which he clearly demonstrated he had been guilty, to no ordinary extent, in wilfully absenting himself from the society of his anxious friends, and, still more, in endeavouring to escape from them after so much trouble and expense had been incurred in his recovery. Mr. Fagin laid great stress on the fact of his having taken Oliver in, and cherished him, when, without his timely aid, he might have perished with hunger. And he related the dismal and affecting history of a young lad whom, in his philanthropy, he had succoured under parallel circumstances, but who, proving unworthy of his confidence, and evincing a desire to communicate with the police, had unfortunately come to be hanged at the Old Bailey one morning. Mr. Fagin did not seek to conceal his share in the catastrophe, but lamented with tears in his eyes, that the wrong-headed and treacherous behaviour of the young person in question had rendered it necessary that he should become the victim of certain evidence for the Crown, which, if it were not precisely true, was indispensably necessary for the safety of him, Mr. Fagin, and a few select friends. Mr. Fagin concluded by drawing a rather disagreeable picture of the discomforts of hanging, and, with great friendliness and politeness of manner, expressed his anxious hopes that he might never be obliged to submit Oliver Twist to that unpleasant operation. Little Oliver's blood ran cold as he listened to the Jew's words, and imperfectly comprehended the dark threats conveyed in them, that it was possible, even for justice itself, to confound the innocent with the guilty, when they were in accidental companionship, he knew already, and that deeply laid plans for the destruction of inconveniently knowing or over-communicative persons had been really devised and carried out by the Jew on more occasions than one, he thought by no means unlikely, when he recollected the general nature of the altercations between that gentleman and Mr. Sykes, which seemed to bear reference to some foregone conspiracy of the kind. As he glanced timidly up, and met the Jew's searching look, he felt that his pale face and trembling limbs were neither unnoticed nor unrelished by that wary old gentleman. The Jew smiling hideously, patted Oliver on the head, and said that if he kept himself quiet and applied himself to business, he saw they would be very good friends yet. Then, taking his hat, and covering himself with an old patched greatcoat, he went out, and locked the room-door behind him. And so Oliver remained all that day, and for the greater part of many subsequent days, seeing nobody, between early morning and midnight, and left during the long hours to commune with his own thoughts which, never failing to revert to his kind friends, and the opinion they must long ago have formed of him, were sad indeed. After the lapse of a week or so, the Jew left the room-door unlocked, and he was at liberty to wander about the house. It was a very dirty place. The rooms upstairs had great high wooden chimney-pieces and large doors, with panelled walls and cornices to the ceiling, which, although they were black with neglect and dust, were ornamented in various ways. From all of these tokens, Oliver concluded that a long time ago, before the old Jew was born, it had belonged to better people, and had perhaps been quite gay and handsome, dismal and dreary as it looked now. Spiders had built their webs in the angles of the walls and ceilings, and sometimes, when Oliver walked softly into a room, the mice would scamper across the floor, and run back terrified to their holes. With these exceptions there was neither sight nor sound of any living thing, and often, when it grew dark, and he was tired of wandering from room to room, he would crouch in the corner of the passage by the street door, to be as near living people as he could, and would remain there, listening and counting the hours, until the Jew or the boys returned. In all the rooms the mouldering shutters were fast closed, the bars which held them were screwed tight into the wood. The only light which was admitted, stealing its way through round holes at the top, which made the rooms more gloomy, and filled them with strange shadows. 
there was a back garret window with rusty bars outside, which had no shutter, and out of this Oliver often gazed with a melancholy face for hours together. But nothing was to be descried from it, but a confused and crowded mass of house-tops, blackened chimneys, and gable-ends. Sometimes, indeed, a grisly head might be seen, peering over the parapet wall of a distant house, but it was quickly withdrawn again, and as the window of Oliver's observatory was nailed down, and dimmed with the rain and smoke of years, it was as much as he could do to make out the forms of the different objects beyond, without making any attempt to be seen or heard, which he had as much chance of being as if he had lived inside the ball of St. Paul's Cathedral. One afternoon, the Dodger and Master Bates, being engaged out that evening, the first-named young gentleman took it into his head to evince some anxiety regarding the decoration of his person. To do him justice, this was by no means an habitual weakness with him. And, with this end and aim, he condescendingly commanded Oliver to assist him in his toilet straightway. Oliver was but too glad to make himself useful, too happy to have some faces, however bad, to look upon, too desirous to conciliate those about him when he could honestly do so, to throw any objection in the way of this proposal. So he at once expressed his readiness, and, kneeling on the floor, while the Dodger sat upon the table, so that he could take his foot in his laps, he applied himself to a process which Mr. Dawkins designated as Japanning his trotter-cases. The phrase, rendered into plain English, signifieth cleaning his boots. Whether it was the sense of freedom and independence, which a rational animal may be supposed to feel when he sits on a table in an easy attitude, smoking a pipe, swinging one leg carelessly to and fro, and having his boots cleaned all the time, without even the past trouble of having taken them off, or the prospect of misery of putting them on to disturb his reflections, or whether it was the goodness of the tobacco that soothed the feelings of the dodger, or the mildness of the beer that mollified his thoughts. He was evidently tinctured, for the nonce, with a spice of romance and enthusiasm, foreign to his general nature. He looked down on Oliver with a thoughtful countenance for a brief space, and then, raising his head and heaving a gentle sigh, said, half in abstraction, and half to Master Bates, "'What a pity it is he isn't a prig!' "'Ah!' said Master Charles Bates. "'He don't know what's good for him!' The Dodger sighed again, and resumed his pipe, as did Charlie Bates. They both smoked for some seconds in silence. "'I suppose you don't even know what a prig is,' said the Dodger mournfully. "'I think I know that,' replied Oliver, looking up. "'It's a—your a, the your one, are you not?' inquired Oliver, checking himself. "'I am,' replied the Dodger. "'I'd scorn to be anything else.' Mr. Dawkins gave his hat a ferocious cock, after delivering this sentiment, and looked at Master Bates as if to denote that he would feel obliged by his saying anything to the contrary. "'I am,' repeated the Dodger. "'So's Charlie. So's Fagin. So's Sykes. So's Nancy. So's Bet. So we all are, down to the dog. And he's the downiest one of the lot.' "'And the least given to peaching,' added Charlie Bates. "'He wouldn't so much as bark in a witness-box, for fear of committing himself.' "'No, not if you tied him up in one, and left him there without whittles for a fortnight,' said the Dodger. "'Not a bit of it,' observed Charlie. "'He's a rum dog. Don't he look fierce at any strange cove that laughs or sings when he's in company?' pursued the Dodger. "'Won't he growl at all, when he hears a fiddle playing? And only eight other dogs as ain't of his breed? <laughs> oh, no! He's an out-and-out -out Christian,' said Charlie. This was merely intended as a tribute to the animal's abilities, but it was an appropriate remark in another sense, if Master Bates had only known it. For there are a good many ladies and gentlemen claiming to be out-and-out -out Christians, between whom and Mr. Sykes's dog there exist strong and singular points of resemblance. "'Well, well,' said the Dodger, recurring to the point from which they had strayed, with that mindfulness of his profession which influenced all his proceedings. "'This hasn't got anything to do with young Green here.' "'No more it has,' said Charlie. "'Why don't you put yourself under Fagin, Oliver? "'And make your fortune out of hand,' added the Dodger with a grin. 
and so be able to retire on your property and do the genteel as i mean to in the very next leap year but four that ever comes and the forty-second tuesday in trinity week said charley bates i don't like it rejoined oliver timidly i wish they would let me go i i would rather go and fagin would rather not rejoined charley oliver knew this too well but thinking it might be dangerous to express his feelings more openly he only sighed and went on with his boot cleaning go exclaimed the dodger why where's your spirit don't you take any pride out of yourself would you go and be dependent on your friends oh blow that said master bates drawing two or three silk handkerchiefs from his pocket and tossing them into a cupboard that's too mean that is i couldn't do it said the dodger with an air of haughty disgust you can leave your friends though said oliver with a half smile and let them be punished for what you did that rejoined the dodger with a wave of his pipe that was all out of consideration for fagin cause the traps know that we work together and he might have got into trouble if we hadn't made our lucky that was a move wasn't it charley master bates nodded assent and would have spoken but the recollection of oliver's flight came so suddenly upon him that the smoke he was inhaling got entangled with a laugh and went up into his head and down into his throat and brought on a fit of coughing and stamping about five minutes long look here said the dodger drawing forth a handful of shillings and halfpence here's a jolly life what's the odds where it comes from here catch hold there's plenty more where they were took from you won't won't you oh you precious flat it's naughty ain't it oliver inquired charley bates he'll come to be scragged won't he i don't know what that means replied oliver something in this way old feller said charley as he said it master bates caught up an end of his neckerchief and holding it erect in the air dropped his head on his shoulder and jerked a curious sound through his teeth thereby indicating by a lively pantomimic representation that scragging and hanging were one and the same thing that's what it means said charley look how he stares jack i never did see such prime company as that ere boy he be the death of me i know he will master charley bates having laughed heartily again resumed his pipe with tears in his eyes you have been brought up bad said the dodger surveying his boots with much satisfaction when oliver had polished them fagin will make something of you though or you'll be the first he ever had that turned out unprofitable you better begin at once or you'll come to the trade long before you think of it, and you're only losing time, Oliver." Master Bates backed this advice with sundry moral admonitions of his own, which, being exhausted, he and his friend Mr. Dawkins launched into a glowing description of the numerous pleasures incidental to the life they led, interspersed with a variety of hints to Oliver that the best thing he could do would be to secure Fagin's favour without more delay by the means which they themselves had employed to gain it. "'And always put this in your pipe, Nolly,' said the Dodger, as the Jew was heard unlocking the door above. "'If you don't take fogles and tickers—' "'What's the good of talking in that way?' interposed Master Bates. "'He don't know what you mean.' "'If you don't take pocket handkerchiefs and watches,' said the Dodger, reducing his conversation to the level of Oliver's capacity, some other cove will so that the coves that lose em will be all the worse and you'll be all the worse too and nobody half a hapeth the better except the chaps what gets em and you've just as good a right to them as they have to be sure to be sure said the jew who had entered unseen by oliver it all lies in a nutshell my dear in a nutshell take the dodger's word for it <laughs> he understands the catechism of his trade 
the old man rubbed his hands gleefully together, as he corroborated the Dodger's reasoning in these terms, and chuckled with delight at his pupil's proficiency. The conversation proceeded no farther at this time, for the Jew had returned home, accompanied by Miss Betsy, and a gentleman whom Oliver had never seen before, but who was accosted by the Dodger as Tom Chitling, and who, having lingered on the stairs to exchange a few gallantries with the lady, now made his appearance. Mr. Chitling was older in years than the Dodger, having perhaps numbered eighteen winters, but there was a degree of deference in his deportment towards that young gentleman, which seemed to indicate that he felt himself conscious of a slight inferiority in point of genius and professional acquirements. He had small twinkling eyes, and a pock-marked face, wore a fur cap, a dark corduroy jacket, greasy fustian trousers, and an apron. His wardrobe was, in truth, rather out of repair, but he excused himself to the company by stating that his time was only out an hour before, and that, in consequence of having worn the regimentals for six weeks past, he had not been able to bestow any attention on his private clothes. Mr. Chitling added, with strong marks of irritation, that the new way of fumigating clothes up yonder was infernal unconstitutional, for it burnt holes in them, and there was no remedy against the county. The same remark he considered to apply to the regulation mode of cutting the hair, which he held to be decidedly unlawful. Mr. Chitling wound up his observations by stating that he had not touched a drop of anything for forty-two moral, long, hard-working days, and that he wished he might be busted if he weren't as dry as a lime-basket. "'Where do you think the gentleman has come from, Oliver?' inquired the Jew with a grin, as the other boys put a bottle of spirits on the table. "'I—I I don't know, sir,' replied Oliver. "'Who's that?' inquired Tom Chitling, casting a contemptuous look at Oliver. "'A young friend of mine, my dear,' replied the Jew. "'He's in luck, then.' said the young man, with a meaning look at Fagin. "'Never mind where I came from, young un. You'll find your way there soon enough. I'll bet a crown.' At this sally the boys laughed. After some more jokes on the same subject, they exchanged a few short whispers with Fagin, and withdrew. After some words apart between the last comer and Fagin, they drew their chairs towards the fire, and the Jew, telling Oliver to come and sit by him, led the conversation to the topics most calculated to interest his hearers. These were the great advantages of the trade, the proficiency of the Dodger, the amiability of Charlie Bates, and the liberality of the Jew himself. At length these subjects displayed signs of being thoroughly exhausted, and Mr. Chitling did the same, for the house of correction becomes fatiguing after a week or two. Miss Betsy accordingly withdrew and left the party to their repose. From this day Oliver was seldom left alone, but was placed in almost constant communication with the two boys, who played the old game with the Jew every day, whether for their own improvement or Oliver's, Mr. Fagin best knew. At other times the old man would tell them stories of robberies he had committed in his younger days, mixed up with so much that was droll and curious that Oliver could not help laughing heartily and showing that he was amused in spite of all his better feelings. In short, the wily old Jew had the boy in his toils, having prepared his mind, by solitude and gloom, to prefer any society to the companionship of his own sad thoughts in such a dreary place, he was now slowly instilling into his soul the poison which he hoped would blacken it, and change its hue for ever. End of chapter 18。Chapter 19 of Oliver Twist。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Recorded by Mill Nicholson。Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens。Chapter 19 。In which a notable plan is discussed and determined on。It was a chill, damp, windy night, when the Jew, buttoning his great-coat tight round his shrivelled body, and pulling the collar up over his ears, so as completely to obscure the lower part of his face, emerged from his den. 
he paused on the step as the door was locked and chained behind him, and having listened while the boys made all secure, and until their retreating footsteps were no longer audible, slunk down the street as quickly as he could. The house to which Oliver had been conveyed was in the neighbourhood of Whitechapel. The Jew stopped for an instant at the corner of the street, and, glancing suspiciously round, crossed the road, and struck off in the direction of Spitalfields. The mud lay thick upon the stones, and a black mist hung over the streets. The rain fell sluggishly down, and everything felt cold and clammy to the touch. It seemed just the night when it befitted such a being as the Jew to be abroad. As he glided stealthily along, creeping beneath the shelter of the walls and doorways, the hideous old man seemed like some loathsome reptile, engendered in the slime and darkness through which he moved, crawling forth by night in search of some rich offal for a meal. He kept on his course through many winding and narrow ways, until he reached Bethnal Green. Then, turning suddenly off to the left, he soon became involved in a maze of the mean and dirty streets which abound in that close and densely populated quarter. The Jew was evidently too familiar with the ground he traversed to be at all bewildered, either by the darkness of the night or the intricacies of the way. He hurried through several alleys and streets, and at length turned into one lighted only by a single lamp at the farther end. At the door of a house in this street he knocked. Having exchanged a few muttered words with the person who opened it, he walked upstairs. A dog growled as he touched the handle of a room door, and a man's voice demanded who was there. "'Only me, Bill, only me, my dear,' said the Jew, looking in. "'Bring in your body, then,' said Sykes. "'Lie down, you stupid brute. Don't you know the devil, when he's got a great coat on?' Apparently, the dog had been somewhat deceived by Mr. Fagin's outer garment, for as the Jew unbuttoned it, and threw it over the back of a chair, he retired to the corner from which he had risen, wagging his tail as he went, to show that he was as well satisfied as it was in his nature to be. "'Well,' said Sykes, "'Well, my dear,' replied the Jew, "'Ah, Nancy!' The latter recognition was uttered with just enough of embarrassment to imply a doubt of its reception, for Mr. Fagin and his young friend had not met since she had interfered in behalf of Oliver. All doubts upon the subject, if he had any, were speedily removed by the young lady's behaviour. She took her feet off the fender, pushed back her chair, and bade Fagin draw up his, without saying more about it, for it was a cold night and no mistake. "'It is cold, Nancy, dear,' said the Jew, as he warmed his skinny hands over the fire. "'It seems to go right through one,' added the old man, touching his side. "'It must be a piercer, if it finds his way through your heart,' said Mr. Sykes. "'Give him something to drink, Nancy. Burn my body, make haste. It's enough to turn a man ill.' to see his lean old carcass shivering in that way like an ugly ghost just rose from the grave." Nancy quickly brought a bottle from a cupboard, in which there were many, which, to judge from the diversity of their appearance, were filled with several kinds of liquids. Sykes, pouring out a glass of brandy, bade the Jew drink it off. "'Quite enough, quite, thank ye, Bill,' replied the Jew, putting down the glass, after just setting his lips to it. "'What? You're afraid of our getting the better of you, are you?' inquired Sykes, fixing his eye on the Jew. "'Ugh!' With a hoarse grunt of contempt, Mr. Sykes seized the glass, and threw the remainder of its contents into the ashes, as a preparatory ceremony to filling it again for himself, which he did at once. The Jew glanced round the room, as his companion tossed down the second glassful, not in curiosity, for he had seen it often before, but in a restless and suspicious manner habitual to him. It was a meanly furnished apartment, with nothing but the contents of the closet to induce the belief that its occupier was anything but a working man, and with no more suspicious articles displayed to view than two or three heavy bludgeons which stood in a corner, and a life-preserver that hung over the chimney-piece. "'There,' said Sykes, smacking his lips, "'now I'm ready.' "'For business?' 
inquired the Jew. "'For business,' replied Sykes. "'So, say what you've got to say.' "'About the crib at Chertsey, Bill,' said the Jew, drawing his chair forward, and speaking in a very low voice. "'Yes, what about it?' inquired Sykes. "'Ah, you know what I mean, my dear.' said the Jew. "'He knows what I mean, Nancy, don't he?' "'No, he don't,' sneered Mr. Sykes. "'Or he won't. And that's the same thing. Speak out, and call things by their right names. Don't sit there winking and blinking and talking to me in hints, as if you weren't the very first that thought about the robbery. What do you mean?' "'Hush, Bill, hush,' said the Jew who had in vain attempted to stop this burst of indignation. "'Somebody will hear us, my dear. Somebody will hear us.' "'Let him hear,' said Sykes. "'I don't care.' But as Mr. Sykes did care, on reflection, he dropped his voice as he said the words, and grew calmer. "'There, there,' said the Jew coaxingly. "'It was only my caution, nothing more.' "'Now, my dear, about that crib at Chertsey. "'When is it to be done, Bill, eh? "'When is it to be done? "'Such plate, my dear, such plate,' said the Jew, "'rubbing his hands and elevating his eyebrows in a rapture of anticipation. "'Not at all,' replied Sykes coldly. "'Not to be done at all?' echoed the Jew, leaning back in his chair. "'No, not at all,' rejoined Sykes. "'At least, it can't be a put-up job as we expected.' "'Then it hasn't been properly gone about,' said the Jew, turning pale with anger. "'Don't tell me, but I will tell you,' retorted Sykes. "'Who are you? It's not to be told. I tell you that Toby Crackett has been hanging about the place for a fortnight, and he can't get one of the servants in line. "'Do you mean to tell me, Bill,' said the Jew, softening as the other grew heated, "'that neither of the two men in the house can be got over?' "'Yes, I do mean to tell you so,' replied Sykes. "'The old lady has had him these twenty years, and if you were to give him five hundred pounds, they wouldn't be in it.' "'What do you mean to say, my dear?' remonstrated the Jew. "'That the women can't be got over?' "'Not a bit of it,' replied Sykes. "'Not by flash, Toby Crackett,' said the Jew incredulously. "'Think what women are, Bill.' "'No, not even by flash, Toby Crackett,' replied Sykes. "'He says he's worn sham whiskers.' and a canary waistcoat. The whole blessed time he's been loitering down there, and it's all of no use. He should have tried mustachios, and a pair of military trousers, my dear," said the Jew. "'So he did,' rejoined Sykes, "'and they want of no more use than the other plant.' The Jew looked blank at this information. After ruminating for some minutes with his chin sunk on his breast, he raised his head and said, with a deep sigh, that if Flash Toby Crackett reported aright, he feared the game was up. "'And yet,' said the old man, dropping his hands on his knees, "'it's a sad thing, my dear, to lose so much when we'd set our hearts upon it.' "'So it is,' said Mr. Sykes. "'Worse luck.' A long silence ensued, during which the Jew was plunged in deep thought, with his face wrinkled into an expression of villainy perfectly demoniacal. Sykes eyed him furtively from time to time. Nancy, apparently fearful of irritating the housebreaker, sat with her eyes fixed upon the fire, as if she had been deaf to all that passed. "'Fagin,' said Sykes, abruptly breaking the stillness that prevailed, "'is it worth fifty shiners extra, if it's safely done from the outside?' Yes, said the Jew, as suddenly rousing himself. Is it a bargain? inquired Sykes. 
"'Yes, my dear, yes,' rejoined the Jew, his eyes glistening, and every muscle in his face working with the excitement that the inquiry had awakened. "'Then,' said Sykes, thrusting aside the Jew's hand with some disdain, "'let it come off as soon as you like. Toby and me were over the garden wall the night afore last, sounding the panels of the door and shutters. The crib's barred up at night like a jail, but there's one part we can crack, safe and softly.' "'Which is that, Bill?' asked the Jew eagerly. "'Why,' whispered Sykes, "'as you cross the lawn—' "'Yes,' said the Jew, bending his head forward, with his eyes almost starting out of it. "'Hush!' cried Sykes, stopping short, as the girl, scarcely moving her head, looked suddenly round, and pointed for an instant to the Jew's face. "'Never mind which part it is.' You can't do it without me, I know, but it's best to be on the safe side when one deals with you." "'As you like, my dear, as you like,' replied the Jew. "'Is there no help wanted but yours and Toby's?' "'None,' said Sykes, "'cept a centre bit and a boy. The first we both got, the second you must find us.' "'And boy?' exclaimed the Jew. "'Oh, then it's a panel, eh?' "'Never mind what it is,' replied Sykes. "'I want a boy, and he mustn't be a big un. "'Lord!' said Mr. Sykes, reflectively. "'If I'd only got that young boy and Ned, the chimbley sweepers, he kept him small on purpose, and let me out by the job. But the father gets lagged and then the juvenile delinquent society comes and takes the boy away from a trade where he was earning money, teaches him to read and write, and in time makes a prentice of him. And so they go on," said Mr. Sykes, his wrath rising with the recollection of his wrongs. So they go on. And if they haven't got enough money, which it's a providence they haven't, we shouldn't have half a dozen boys left in the old trade in a year or two. "'No more we should,' acquiesced the Jew, who had been considering during his speech, and had only caught the last sentence. "'Bill?' "'What now?' inquired Sykes. The Jew nodded his head towards Nancy, who was still gazing at the fire, and intimated by a sign that he would have her told to leave the room. Sykes shrugged his shoulders impatiently, as if he thought the precaution unnecessary but complied, nevertheless, by requesting Miss Nancy to fetch him a jug of beer. "'You don't want any beer,' said Nancy, folding her arms and retaining her seat very composedly. "'I tell you, I do,' replied Sykes. "'Nonsense,' returned the girl coolly. "'Go on, Fagin. I know what he's going to say, Bill. He needn't mind me.' The Jew still hesitated. Sykes looked from one to the other, in some surprise. "'Why, you don't mind the old girl, do you, Fagin?' he asked at length. "'You've known her long enough to trust her, or the devil's in it. She ain't want a blab, are you, Nancy?' "'I should think not,' replied the young lady, drawing her chair up to the table, and putting her elbows upon it. "'No, no, my dear, I know you're not,' said the Jew. "'But—' and again the old man paused. "'But what?' inquired Sykes. "'I didn't know whether she mightn't perhaps be out of sorts, you know, my dear, as she was the other night,' replied the Jew. At this confession Miss Nancy burst into a loud laugh and, swallowing a glass of brandy, shook her head with an air of defiance, and burst into sundry exclamations of, "'Keep the game a-going! Never say die!' and the like. These seemed to have the effect of reassuring both gentlemen, for the Jew nodded his head with a satisfied air, and resumed his seat, as did Mr. Sykes likewise. "'Now, Fagin,' said Nancy with a laugh, "'tell Bill at once about Oliver.' "'Ah, you're a clever one, my dear. The sharpest girl I ever saw,' 
said the Jew, patting her on the neck. "'It was about Oliver I was going to speak, sure enough. <laughs> "'What about him?' demanded Sykes. "'He's the boy for you, my dear,' replied the Jew in a hoarse whisper, laying his finger on the side of his nose and grinning frightfully. "'He?' exclaimed Sykes. "'Have him, Bill,' said Nancy. "'I would, if I was in your place. He might be so much up as any of the others, but that's not what you want. If he's only to open a door for you, depend upon it, he's a safe one, Bill.' "'I know he is,' rejoined Fagin. "'He's been in good training these last few weeks, and it's time he began to work for his bread. Besides, the others are all too big.' "'Well, he is just the size I want,' said Mr. Sykes, ruminating. "'And we'll do everything you want, Bill, my dear,' interposed the Jew. "'He can't help himself.' "'That is, if you frighten him enough.' "'Frighten him?' echoed Sykes. "'It'll be no sham frightening, mind you. "'If there's anything queer about him, when we once get into the work, "'in for a penny, in for a pound, "'you won't see him alive again, Fagin. "'Think of that before you send him. "'Mark my words,' said the robber, "'poising a crowbar which he had drawn from under the bedstead. "'I thought of it all,' said the Jew, with energy. "'I've—I've had my eye upon him, my dears, close, close. Once let him feel that he is one of us. Once fill his mind with the idea that he has been a thief, and he's ours. Ours for life. (laughs) Oh, he couldn't have come about better.' The old man crossed his arms upon his breast, and, drawing his head and shoulders into a heap, literally hugged himself for joy. "'Ours?' said Sykes. "'Yours, you mean?' "'Perhaps I do, my dear,' said the Jew, with a shrill chuckle. "'Mine, if you like, Bill.' "'And what?' said Sykes, scowling fiercely on his agreeable friend. "'What makes you take so much pains about one chalk-faced kid, when you know there are fifty boys snoozing about common garden every night?' as you might pick and choose from? "'Because they're of no use to me, my dear,' replied the Jew, with some confusion. "'Not worth the taking. Their looks convict em when they get into trouble, and I lose em all. With this boy properly managed, my dears, I could do what I couldn't with twenty of them. Besides,' said the Jew, recovering his self-possession, he has us now, if he could only give us leg-bail again, and he must be in the same boat with us. Never mind how he came there. It's quite enough for my power over him that he was in a robbery. That's all I want. Now, how much better this is than being obliged to put the poor little boy out of the way, which would be dangerous, and we should lose by it besides. "'When is it to be done?' asked Nancy, stopping some turbulent exclamation on the part of Mr. Sykes, expressive of the disgust with which he received Fagin's affectation of humanity. "'Ah, to be sure,' said the Jew. "'When is it to be done, Bill?' "'I'll plan with Toby the night out of to-morrow,' rejoined Sykes in a surly voice, "'if he heard nothing from me to the contrary.' "'Good!' said the Jew. "'There's no moon.' "'No,' rejoined Sykes. "'It's all arranged about bringing off the swag, is it?' asked the Jew. Sykes nodded. "'And about—oh, ah, it's all planned,' rejoined Sykes, interrupting him. "'Never mind particulars. You'd better bring the boy here to-morrow night. I shall get off the stone an hour after daybreak. Then you hold your tongue—' I'll keep the melting pot ready, and that's all you'll have to do." After some discussion, in which all three took an active part, it was decided that Nancy should repair to the Jews next evening, when the night had set in, and bring Oliver away with her. Fagin craftily observing that if he evinced any disinclination to the task, 
he would be more willing to accompany the girl who had so recently interfered in his behalf than anybody else. It was also solemnly arranged that poor Oliver should, for the purposes of the contemplated expedition, be unreservedly consigned to the care and custody of Mr. William Sykes, and further, that the said Sykes should deal with him as he thought fit, and should not be held responsible by the Jew for any mischance or evil that might be necessary to visit him, it being understood that, to render the compact in this respect binding, any representations made by Mr. Sykes on his return should be required to be confirmed and corroborated, in all important particulars, by the testimony of Flash Toby Crackett. These preliminaries adjusted, Mr. Sykes proceeded to drink brandy at a furious rate, and to flourish the crowbar in an alarming manner, yelling forth at the same time most unmusical snatches of song, mingled with wild execrations. At length, in a fit of professional enthusiasm, he insisted upon producing his box of housebreaking tools, which he had no sooner stumbled in with, and opened for the purpose of explaining the nature and properties of the various implements it contained, and the peculiar beauties of their construction, than he fell over the box upon the floor, and went to sleep where he fell. "'Good night, Nancy,' said the Jew, muffling himself up as before. "'Good night.' Their eyes met and the Jew scrutinized her narrowly. There was no flinching about the girl. She was as true and earnest in the matter as Toby Crackett himself could be. The Jew again bade her good-night, and, bestowing a sly kick upon the prostrate form of Mr. Sykes while her back was turned, groped downstairs. "'Always the way,' muttered the Jew to himself, as he turned homeward. "'The worst of these women is—' and a very little thing serves to call up some long-forgotten feeling, and the best of them is that it never lasts. <laughs> the man against the child for a bag of gold." Beguiling the time with these pleasant reflections, Mr. Fagin wended his way through mud and mire to his gloomy abode, where the Dodger was sitting up impatiently awaiting his return. "'Is Oliver abed? I want to speak to him,' was his first remark, as they descended the stairs. "'Hours ago,' replied the Dodger, throwing open a door. "'Here he is.' The boy was lying fast asleep, on a rude bed upon the floor, so pale with anxiety and sadness, and the closeness of his prison, that he looked like death. Not death as it shows in shroud and coffin, but in the guise it wears, when life has just departed, when a young and gentle spirit has, but an instant, fled to heaven, and the gross air of the world has not had time to breathe upon the changing dust it hallowed. "'Not now,' said the Jew, turning softly away. "'Tomorrow, tomorrow.'" End of chapter 19《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《》《
"'I suppose,' said the Jew, fixing his eyes on Oliver, "'you want to know what you're going to Bill's for, eh, my dear?' Oliver coloured involuntarily, to find that the old thief had been reading his thoughts, but boldly said yes, he did want to know. "'Why do you think?' inquired Fagin, parrying the question. "'Indeed, I don't know, sir,' replied Oliver. "'Bah!' said the Jew, turning away with a disappointed countenance from a close perusal of the boy's face. "'Wait till Bill tells you, then.' The Jew seemed much vexed by Oliver's not expressing any greater curiosity on the subject. But the truth is, that, although Oliver felt very anxious, he was too much confused by the earnest cunning of Fagin's looks, and his own speculations, to make any further inquiries just then. He had no other opportunity, for the Jew remained very surly and silent till night, when he prepared to go abroad. "'You may burn a candle,' said the Jew, putting one upon the table, "'and here's a book for you to read, till they come to fetch you. Good night.' "'Good night.' replied Oliver softly. The Jew walked to the door, looking over his shoulder at the boy as he went. Suddenly stopping, he called him by his name. Oliver looked up. The Jew, pointing to the candle, motioned him to light it. He did so, and, as he placed the candlestick upon the table, saw that the Jew was gazing fixedly at him, with lowering and contracted brows, from the dark end of the room. "'Take heed, Oliver, take heed,' said the old man, shaking his right hand before him in a warning manner. "'He's a rough man, and thinks nothing of blood when his own is up. Whatever falls out, say nothing, and do what he bids you mind.' Placing a strong emphasis on the last word, he suffered his features gradually to resolve themselves into a ghastly grin, and, nodding his head, left the room. Oliver leaned his head upon his hand when the old man disappeared, and pondered with a trembling heart on the words he had just heard. The more he thought of the Jew's admonition, the more he was at a loss to divine its real purpose and meaning. He could think of no bad object to be attained by sending him to Sykes, which would not be equally well answered by his remaining with Fagin, and after meditating for a long time, concluded that he had been selected to perform some ordinary menial offices for the housebreaker, until another boy, better suited for his purpose, could be engaged. He was too well accustomed to suffering, and had suffered too much where he was, to bewail the prospect of change very severely. He remained lost in thought for some minutes, and then, with a heavy sigh, snuffed the candle and, taking up the book which the Jew had left with him, began to read. He turned over the leaves, carelessly at first, but, lighting on a passage which attracted his attention, he soon became intent upon the volume. It was a history of the lives and trials of great criminals, and the pages were soiled and thumbed with use. Here he read of dreadful crimes that made the blood run cold of secret murders that had been committed by the lonely wayside, of bodies hidden from the eye of man in deep pits and wells, which would not keep them down, deep as they were, but had yielded them up at last after many years, and so maddened the murderers with the sight, that in their horror they had confessed their guilt, and yelled for the gibbet to end their agony. Here, too, he read of men who, lying in their beds at dead of night, had been tempted, so they said, and led on, by their own bad thoughts, to such dreadful bloodshed as it made the flesh creep and the limbs quail to think of. The terrible descriptions were so real and vivid that the sallow pages seemed to turn red with gore, and the words upon them to be sounded in his ears as if they were whispered in hollow murmurs by the spirits of the dead. In a paroxysm of fear, the boy closed the book and thrust it from him. Then, falling upon his knees, he prayed heaven to spare him from such deeds, and rather to will that he should die at once, than be reserved for crimes so fearful and appalling. By degrees he grew more calm, and besought, in a low and broken voice, that he might be rescued from his present dangers, 
and that if any aid were to be raised up for a poor outcast boy, who had never known the love of friends or kindred, it might come to him now, when, desolate and deserted, he stood alone in the midst of wickedness and guilt. He had concluded his prayer, but still remained with his head buried in his hands, when a rustling noise aroused him. "'What's that?' he cried, starting up, and catching sight of a figure standing by the door. "'Who's there?' "'Me. Only me,' replied a tremulous voice. Oliver raised the candle above his head, and looked towards the door. It was Nancy. "'Put down the light,' said the girl, turning away her head. "'It hurts my eyes.' Oliver saw that she was very pale, and gently inquired if she were ill. The girl threw herself into a chair, with her back towards him, and wrung her hands, but made no reply. "'God forgive me!' she cried after a while. "'I never thought of this.' "'Has anything happened?' asked Oliver. "'Can I help you? I will if I can. I will indeed.' She rocked herself to and fro, caught her throat, and, uttering a gurgling sound, gasped for breath. "'Nancy!' cried Oliver. "'What is it?' The girl beat her hands upon her knees, and her feet upon the ground, and, suddenly stopping, drew her shawl close around her, and shivered with cold. Oliver stirred the fire. Drawing her chair close to it, she sat there, for a little time, without speaking, but at length she raised her head, and looked round. "'I don't know what comes over me sometimes,' said she, affecting to busy herself in arranging her dress. "'It's this damp, dirty room, I think. Now, Nolly, dear, are you ready?' "'Am I to go with you?' asked Oliver. "'Yes. I've come from Bill,' replied the girl. "'You ought to go with me.' "'What for?' asked Oliver, recoiling. "'What for?' echoed the girl, raising her eyes and averting them again, the moment they encountered the boy's face. "'Oh, for no harm.' "'I don't believe it said Oliver, who had watched her closely. "'Have it your own way,' rejoined the girl, affecting to laugh. "'For no good, then.' Oliver could see that he had some power over the girl's better feelings, and, for an instant, thought of appealing to her compassion for his helpless state. But then the thought darted across his mind that it was barely eleven o'clock, and that many people were still in the streets, of whom surely some might be found to give credence to his tale. As the reflection occurred to him, he stepped forward, and said, somewhat hastily, that he was ready. Neither his brief consideration, nor its purport, were lost on his companion. She eyed him narrowly while he spoke, and cast upon him a look of intelligence which sufficiently showed that she guessed what had been passing in his thoughts. "'Hush!' said the girl, stooping over him, and pointing to the door, as she looked cautiously around. "'You can't help yourself.' I have tried hard for you, but all to no purpose. You are hedged round and round. If ever you are to get loose from here, this is not the time." Struck by the energy of her manner, Oliver looked up in her face with great surprise. She seemed to speak the truth. Her countenance was white and agitated, and she trembled with very earnestness. "'I have saved you from being ill-used once, and I will again, and I do now,' continued the girl aloud for those who would have fetched you, if I had not, would have been far more rough than me. I have promised for your being quiet and silent. If you are not, you will only do harm to yourself, and me too, and perhaps be my death. See here, I have borne all this for you already, as true as God sees me, show it." She pointed hastily to some livid bruises on her neck and arms, and continued with great rapidity. Remember this and don't let me suffer more for you just now. If I could help you, I would. But I have not the power. They don't mean to harm you. Whatever they make you do is no fault of yours. Hush! Every word from you is a blow for me. Give me your hand. Make haste. Your hand." She caught the hand which Oliver instinctively placed in hers, and blowing out the light, drew him after her up the stairs. The door was opened quickly, by someone shrouded in the darkness, and was as quickly closed when they had passed out. A hackney cabriolet was in waiting. With the same vehemence which she had exhibited in addressing Oliver, the girl pulled him in with her, and drew the curtains close. The driver wanted no directions, 
but lashed his horse into full speed without the delay of an instant. The girl still held Oliver fast by the hand, and continued to pour into his ear the warnings and assurances she had already imparted. All were so quick and hurried that he had scarcely time to recollect where he was, or how he came there, when the carriage stopped at the house to which the Jew's steps had been directed on the previous evening. For one brief moment Oliver cast a hurried glance along the empty street, and a cry for help hung upon his lips. But the girl's voice was in his ear, beseeching him in such tones of agony to remember her, that he had not the heart to utter it. While he hesitated, the opportunity was gone. He was already in the house, and the door was shut. "'This way,' said the girl, releasing her hold for the first time. "'Bill!' Hello replied Sykes, appearing at the head of the stairs with a candle. "'Oh, that's the time of day. Come on.' This was a very strong expression of approbation, an uncommonly hearty welcome, from a person of Mr. Sykes's temperament. Nancy, appearing much gratified thereby, saluted him cordially. "'Bullseye's gone home with Tom,' observed Sykes as he lighted them up. "'He'd have been in the way.' "'That's right,' rejoined Nancy. "'So you got the kid?' said Sykes, when they had all reached the room, closing the door as he spoke. "'Yes, here he is,' replied Nancy. "'Did he come quiet?' inquired Sykes. "'Like a lamb,' rejoined Nancy. "'I'm glad to hear it,' said Sykes, looking grimly at Oliver, "'for the sake of his young carcass, as would otherwise have suffered for it. Come here, young un and let me read you a lecture, which is as well got over at once." Thus addressing his new pupil, Mr. Sykes pulled off Oliver's cap and threw it into a corner, and then, taking him by the shoulder, sat himself down by the table, and stood the boy in front of him. "'Now, first, do you know what this is?' inquired Sykes, taking up a pocket pistol which lay on the table. Oliver replied in the affirmative. "'Well, then, look here,' continued Sykes. "'This is powder. That is a bullet. And this is a little bit of an old hat for Wadden.' Oliver murmured his comprehension of the different bodies referred to, and Mr. Sykes proceeded to load the pistol with great nicety and deliberation. "'Now it's loaded,' said Mr. Sykes, when he had finished. "'Yes, I see it is, sir,' replied Oliver. "'Well,' said the robber, grasping Oliver's wrist, and putting the barrel so close to his temple that they touched, at which moment the boy could not repress a start. "'If you speak a word when you're out of doors with me, except when I speak to you, that loading will be in your head without notice. So—' If you do make up your mind to speak without leave, say your prayers first." Having bestowed a scowl upon the object of this warning, to increase its effect, Mr. Sykes continued, "'As near as I know, there isn't anybody as would be asking very particular art of you, if you was disposed of. So I needn't take this devil and all a trouble to explain matters to you if it warn't for your own good. Do you hear me?" "'The short and long of what you mean,' said Nancy, speaking very emphatically and slightly frowning at Oliver, as if to bespeak his serious attention to her words, is that, if you're cross by him in this job, you have on hand, you'll prevent his ever telling tales afterwards, by shooting him through the head, and will take your chance of swinging for it, as you do for a great many other things in the way of business every month of your life. "'That's it,' observed Mr. Sykes approvedly. "'Women can always put things in fewest words, except when it's blowing up, and then they lengthens it out. And now he's thoroughly up to it. Let's have some supper, and get a snooze before starting.' In pursuance of this request, Nancy quickly laid the cloth. Disappearing for a few minutes, she presently returned with a pot of porter and a dish of sheep's heads which gave occasion to several pleasant witticisms on the part of Mr. Sykes, founded upon the singular coincidence of Jemmy's being a can name common to them, and also to an ingenious implement much used in his profession. 
Indeed, the worthy gentleman, stimulated perhaps by the immediate prospect of being on active service, was in great spirits and good humour, in proof whereof it may be here remarked that he humorously drank all the beer at a draught, and did not utter, on a rough calculation, more than fourscore oaths during the whole progress of the meal. Supper being ended, it may be easily conceived that Oliver had no great appetite for it. Mr. Sykes disposed of a couple of glasses of spirits and water, and threw himself on the bed, ordering Nancy, with many imprecations in case of failure, to call him at five precisely. Oliver stretched himself in his clothes, by command of the same authority, on a mattress upon the floor, and the girl, mending the fire, sat before it in readiness to rouse them at the appointed time. For a long time Oliver lay awake, thinking it not impossible that Nancy might seek that opportunity of whispering some further advice, but the girl sat brooding over the fire, without moving, save now and then to trim the light. Weary with watching and anxiety, he at length fell asleep. When he awoke, the table was covered with tea-things, and Sykes was thrusting various articles into the pockets of his greatcoat, which hung over the back of a chair. Nancy was busily engaged in preparing breakfast. It was not yet daylight, for the candle was still burning, and it was quite dark outside. A sharp rain, too, was beating against the window-panes, and the sky looked black and cloudy. "'Now, then,' growled Sykes, as Oliver started up, "'half past five. Look sharp, or you'll get no breakfast, for it's late as it is.' Oliver was not long in making his toilet. Having taken some breakfast, he replied to a surly inquiry from Sykes, by saying that he was quite ready. Nancy, scarcely looking at the boy, threw him a handkerchief to tie round his throat. Sykes gave him a large rough cape to button over his shoulders. Thus attired, he gave his hand to the robber, who, merely pausing to show him, with a menacing gesture, that he had that same pistol in a side pocket of his greatcoat, clasped it firmly in his and, exchanging a farewell with Nancy, led him away. Oliver turned, for an instant, when they reached the door, in the hope of meeting a look from the girl, but she had resumed her old seat in front of the fire, and sat perfectly motionless before it. End of chapter 20《Chapter 21 of Oliver Twist》this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter 21. The Expedition. It was a cheerless morning when they got into the street, blowing and raining hard, and the clouds looking dull and stormy. The night had been very wet. Large pools of water had collected in the road, and the kennels were overflowing. There was a faint glimmering of the coming day in the sky, but it rather aggravated than relieved the gloom of the scene, the sombre light only serving to pale that which the street-lamps afforded, without shedding any warmer or brighter tints upon the wet house-tops and dreary streets. There appeared to be nobody stirring in that quarter of the town. The windows of the houses were all closely shut, and the streets through which they passed were noiseless and empty. By the time they had turned into the Bethnal Green Road, the day had fairly begun to break. Many of the lamps were already extinguished. A few country wagons were slowly toiling on towards London. Now and then a stage-coach, covered with mud, rattled briskly by, the driver bestowing as he passed an admonitory lash upon the heavy wagoner, who, by keeping on the wrong side of the road, had endangered his arriving at the office a quarter of a minute after his time. The public houses, with gas-lights burning inside, were already open. By degrees, other shops began to be unclosed, and a few scattered people were met with. Then came straggling groups of labourers, going to their work. Then men and women with fish-baskets on their heads, donkey-carts laden with vegetables, chaise-carts filled with livestock, or whole carcasses of meat. Milk-women with pails, an unbroken concourse of people, trudging out with various supplies to the eastern suburbs of the town. As they approached the city, the noise and traffic gradually increased. When they threaded the streets between Shoreditch and Smithfield, it had swelled into a roar of sound and bustle. 
it was as light as it was likely to be, till night came on again, and the busy morning of half of the London population had begun. Turning down Sun Street and Crown Street, and crossing Finsbury Square, Mr. Sykes struck, by way of Chiswell Street, into Barbican, thence into Long Lane, and so into Smithfield, from which latter place arose a tumult of discordant sounds that filled Oliver Twist with amazement. It was market morning. The ground was covered nearly ankle-deep with filth and mire, a thick steam perpetually rising from the reeking bodies of the cattle, and mingling with the fog, which seemed to rest upon the chimney-tops, hung heavily above. All the pens in the centre of the large area, and as many temporary pens as could be crowded into the vacant space, were filled with sheep, tied up to posts by the gutter-side, where long lines of beasts and oxen, three or four deep. Countrymen, butchers, drovers, hawkers, boys, thieves, idlers, and vagabonds of every low grade, were mingled together in a mass. The whistling of drovers, the barking dogs, the bellowing and plunging of the oxen, the bleating of sheep, the grunting and squeaking of pigs, the cries of hawkers, the shouts, oaths, and quarrelling on all sides, the ringing of bells and roar of voices that issued from every public house, the crowding, pushing, driving, beating, whooping, and yelling, the hideous and discordant dim that resounded from every corner of the market, and the unwashed, unshaven, squalid, and dirty figures constantly running to and fro, and bursting in and out of the throng, rendered it a stunning and bewildering scene which quite confounded the senses. Mr. Sykes, dragging Oliver after him, elbowed his way through the thickest of the crowd, and bestowed very little attention on the numerous sights and sounds which so astonished the boy. He nodded twice or thrice to a passing friend, and, resisting as many invitations to take a morning dram, pressed steadily onward, until they were clear of the turmoil, and had made their way through Hosier Lane into Hoban. "'Now, young un,' said Sykes, looking up at the clock of St. Andrew's Church, "'hard upon seven. You must step out. Come, don't lag behind already. Lazy legs!' Mr. Sykes accompanied this speech with a jerk at his little companion's wrist. Oliver, quickening up his pace into a kind of trot between a fast walk and a run, kept up with the rapid strides of the housebreaker as well as he could. They held their course at this rate until they had passed Hyde Park Corner, and were on their way to Kensington, when Sykes relaxed his pace, until an empty cart, which was at some little distance behind, came up. Seeing Hounslow written on it, he asked the driver, with as much civility as he could assume, if he would give them a lift as far as Islesworth. "'Jump up!' said the man. "'Is that your boy?' "'Yes, he's my boy,' replied Sykes looking hard at Oliver, and putting his hand abstractedly into the pocket where the pistol was. "'Your father walks rather too quick for you, don't he, my man?' inquired the driver, seeing that Oliver was out of breath. "'Not a bit of it,' replied Sykes, interposing. "'He's used to it. Here, take hold of my hand, Ned. In with you.' Thus addressing Oliver, he helped him into the cart, and the driver, pointing to a heap of sacks, told him to lie down there and rest himself. As they passed the different milestones, Oliver wondered more and more where his companion meant to take him. Kensington, Hammersmith, Chiswick, Kew Bridge, Brentford, were all past, and yet they went on as steadily as if they had only just begun their journey. At length they came to a public-house called the Coach and Horses, a little way beyond which another road appeared to run off and here the cart stopped. Sykes dismounted with great precipitation, holding Oliver by the hand all the while, and lifting him down directly bestowed a furious look upon him, and wrapped the side pocket with his fist in a significant manner. "'Good-bye, boy,' said the man. "'He's sulky,' replied Sykes, giving him a shake. "'He's sulky. A young dog. Don't mind him.' "'Not I,' rejoined the other, getting into his cart. "'It's a fine day, after all.' And he drove away. Sykes waited until he had fairly gone, and then, telling Oliver he might look about him if he wanted, once again led him onward on his journey. They turned round to the left, a short way past the public-house, 
and then, taking a right-hand road, walked on for a long time, passing many large gardens and gentlemen's houses on both sides of the way, and stopping for nothing but a little beer, until they reached a town. Here against the wall of a house, Oliver saw written up in pretty large letters, Hampton. They lingered about in the fields for some hours. At length they came back into the town, and, turning into an old public house with a defaced signboard, ordered some dinner by the kitchen fire. The kitchen was an old, low-roofed room, with a great beam across the middle of the ceiling, and benches with high backs to them by the fire, on which were seated several rough men in smock-frocks, drinking and smoking. They took no notice of Oliver, and very little of Sykes, and, as Sykes took very little notice of them, he and his young comrade sat in a corner by themselves, without being much troubled by their company. They had some cold meat for dinner, and sat so long after it, while Mr. Sykes indulged himself with three or four pipes, that Oliver began to feel quite certain they were not going any further. Being much tired with the walk, and getting up so early, he dozed a little at first. Then, quite overpowered by fatigue and the fumes of the tobacco, fell asleep. It was quite dark when he was awakened by a push from Sykes. Rousing himself sufficiently to sit up and look about him, he found that worthy in close fellowship and communication with a labouring man over a pint of ale. "'So, you're going on to Lower Halliford, are you?' inquired Sykes. "'Yes, I am,' replied the man, who seemed a little the worse, or better, as the case might be, for drinking. "'And not slow about it, neither. My horse hasn't got a load behind him going back, as he had coming up in the morning, and he won't be long a doing of it. He is luck to him. He cod. He's a good un. "'Could you give me and my boy a lift as far as there?' demanded Sykes, pushing the ale towards his new friend. "'If you're going to write directly, I can,' replied the man, looking out of the pot. "'Are you going to Alliford?' "'You're not a Shepperton,' replied Sykes. "'I'm your man as far as I go,' replied the other. "'Is all paid, Becky?' "'Yes, the other gentleman's paid,' replied the girl. "'I say,' said the man, with tipsy gravity, "'that won't do, you know.' "'Why not?' rejoined Sykes. "'You're a-going to accommodate us.' and what's to prevent my standing treat for a pint or so, in return?" The stranger reflected upon this argument with a very profound face. Having done so, he seized Sykes by the hand, and declared he was a real good fellow, to which Mr. Sykes replied he was joking, as if he had been sober there would have been strong reason to suppose he was. After the exchange of a few more compliments, they bade the company good-night, and went out, the girl gathering up the pots and glasses as they did so, and lounging out to the door with their hands full to see the party start. The horse, whose health had been drunk in his absence, was standing outside, ready harnessed to the cart. Oliver and Sykes got in without any further ceremony, and the man to whom he belonged, having lingered for a minute or two to bear him up, and to defy the hostler and the world to produce his equal, mounted also. Then the hostler was told to give the horse his head, and, his head being given him, he made a very unpleasant use of it, tossing it into the air with great disdain, and running into the parlour windows over the way, after performing those feats, and supporting himself for a short time on his hind legs, he started off at great speed, and rattled out of the town right gallantly. The night was very dark. A damp mist rose from the river and the marshy ground about, and spread itself over the dreary fields. It was piercingly cold, too. All was gloomy and black. Not a word was spoken, for the driver had grown sleepy, and Sykes was in no mood to lead him into conversation. Oliver sat huddled together in a corner of the cart, bewildered with alarm and apprehension, and figuring strange objects in the gaunt trees whose branches waved grimly to and fro, as if in some fantastic joy at the desolation of the scene. 
As they passed Sunbury Church, the clock struck seven. There was a light in the ferry house window opposite, which streamed across the road, and threw into more sombre shadow a dark yew tree with graves beneath it. There was a dull sound of falling water not far off, and the leaves of the old tree stirred gently in the night wind. It seemed like quiet music for the repose of the dead. Sunbury was passed through, and they came again into the lonely road. Two or three miles more, and the cart stopped. Sykes alighted, took Oliver by the hand, and they once again walked on. They turned into no house at Shepperton, as the weary boy had expected, but still kept walking on, in mud and darkness, through gloomy lanes and over cold open wastes, until they came within sight of the lights of a town at no great distance. On looking intently forward, Oliver saw that the water was just below them, and that they were coming to the foot of a bridge. Sykes kept straight on, until they were close upon the bridge, then turned suddenly down a bank upon the left. "'The water!' thought Oliver, turning sick with fear. "'He has brought me to this lonely place to murder me!' He was about to throw himself on the ground, and make one struggle for his young life, when he saw that they stood before a solitary house, all ruinous and decayed. There was a window on each side of the dilapidated entrance, and one story above, but no light was visible. The house was dark, dismantled, and the all appearance uninhabited. Sykes, with Oliver's hand still in his, softly approached the low porch and raised the latch. The door yielded to the pressure, and they passed in together. End of chapter 21《ハッピーニューアルバム』This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. Chapter Twenty Two. The Burglary. Hello! cried a loud, hoarse voice as soon as they set foot in the passage. Don't make such a row," said Sykes, bolting the door. "Show a glim, Toby." "'Aha, my pal!' cried the same voice. "'A glim, Barney! A glim! Show the gentleman in, Barney! Wake up first, if convenient!' The speaker appeared to throw a boot-jack, or some such article, at the person he addressed, to rouse him from his slumbers. For the noise of a wooden body, falling violently, was heard, and then an indistinct muttering, as of a man between sleep and awake. "'Dear!' cried the same voice. "'There's Bill Sykes in the passage, with nobody to do the civil with him. And you sleep in there, as if you took laudanum with your meals and nothing stronger. Are you any fresher now, or do you want the iron candlestick to wake you thoroughly?' A pair of slipshod feet shuffled hastily across the bare floor of the room, as this interrogatory was put, and there issued from a door on the right hand first a feeble candle, and next the form of the same individual who has been heretofore described as labouring under the infirmity of speaking through his nose, and officiating as waiter at the public-house on Saffron Hill. "'Bisty Sykes!' exclaimed Barney, with real or counterfeit joy. "'Cubbid, sir! Cubbid! "'Here, you get on first, said Sykes, putting Oliver in front of him. "'Quicker!' or I shall tread upon your heels." Muttering a curse upon his tardiness, Sykes pushed Oliver before him, and they entered a low dark room with a smoky fire, two or three broken chairs, a table, and a very old couch, on which, with his legs much higher than his head, a man was reposing at full length, smoking a long clay pipe. He was dressed in a smartly cut snuff-coloured coat, with large brass buttons, an orange neckerchief, a coarse, staring, shawl-pattern waistcoat, and drab breeches. Mr. Crackett, for he it was, had no very great quantity of hair, either upon his head or face, but what he had was of a reddish dye, and tortured into long corkscrew curls, through which he occasionally thrust some very dirty fingers, ornamented with large common rings. He was a trifle above the middle size, and apparently rather weak in the legs 
but this circumstance by no means detracted from his own admiration of his top-boots, which he contemplated in their elevated situation with lively satisfaction. "'Bill, my boy,' said this figure, turning his head towards the door, "'I'm glad to see you. I was almost afraid you'd given it up, in which case I should have made a personal winter. Hello?' Uttering this exclamation in a tone of great surprise, as his eyes rested on Oliver, Mr. Toby Crackett brought himself into a sitting posture, and demanded who that was. "'The boy! Only the boy!' replied Sykes, drawing a chair towards the fire. "'What of Mr. Fagin's lads?' exclaimed Barney, with a grin. "'Fagin's, eh?' exclaimed Toby, looking at Oliver. "'What an inwallable boy that'll make for the old lady's pockets in chapels! His mug is a fortin to him!' "'There, there's enough of that!' interposed Sykes impatiently, and stooping over his recumbent friend, he whispered a few words in his ear, at which Mr. Crackett laughed immensely, and honoured Oliver with a long stare of astonishment. "'Now,' said Sykes, as he resumed his seat, "'if you'll give us something to eat and drink, while we're waiting, you'll put some art in us, or in me at all events. Sit down by the fire, younger, and rest yourself.' "'for you'll have to go out with us again to-night, though not very far off.' Oliver looked at Sykes, in mute and timid wonder, and, drawing a stool to the fire, sat with his aching head upon his hands, scarcely knowing where he was, or what was passing around him. "'Here,' said Toby, as the young Jew placed some fragments of food and a bottle upon the table, "'success to the crack!' He rose to honour the toast, and, carefully depositing his empty pipe in a corner, advanced to the table, filled a glass with spirits, and drank off its contents. Mr. Sykes did the same. "'A drain for the boy?' said Toby, half filling a wine-glass. "'Down with it, innocence!' "'Indeed,' said Oliver, looking piteously up into the man's face, "'indeed, I down with it!' echoed Toby. "'Do you think I don't know what's good for you? Tell him to drink it, Bill.' "'He had better,' said Sykes, clapping his hand upon his pocket. "'Burn my body, if he isn't more trouble than a whole family of dodgers. Drink it, you perverse imp. Drink it.' Frightened by the menacing gestures of the two men, Oliver hastily swallowed the contents of the glass, and immediately fell into a violent fit of coughing which delighted Toby Crackett and Barney, and even drew a smile from the surly Mr. Sykes. This done, and Sykes having satisfied his appetite, Oliver could eat nothing but a small crust of bread which they made him swallow. The two men laid themselves down on chairs for a short nap. Oliver retained his stool by the fire. Barney, wrapped in a blanket, stretched himself on the floor, close outside the fender. They slept or appeared to sleep for some time, nobody stirring but Barney, who rose once or twice to throw coals on the fire. Oliver fell into a heavy doze, imagining himself straying along the gloomy lanes, or wandering about the dark churchyard, or retracing some one or other of the scenes of the past day, when he was roused by Toby Crackett, jumping up, and declaring it was half-past one. In an instant the other two were on their legs and all were actively engaged in busy preparation. Sykes and his companion enveloped their necks and chins in large dark shawls, and drew on their greatcoats. Barney, opening a cupboard, brought forth several articles, which he hastily crammed into the pockets. "'Barkers for me, Barney,' said Toby Crackett. "'Here they are,' replied Barney, producing a pair of pistols. "'You loaded Deb yourself.' "'All right.' replied Toby, stowing them away. "'The persuaders!' "'I've got em replied Sykes. "'Crape? Keys? Centibits? Darkies? Nothing forgotten?' inquired Toby, fastening a small crowbar to a loop inside the skirt of his coat. "'All right,' rejoined his companion. "'Bring them bits of timber, Barney. That's the time of day.' With these words, 
he took a thick stick from Barney's hands, who, having delivered another to Toby, busied himself in fastening on Oliver's cape. "'Now, then,' said Sykes, holding out his hand. Oliver, who was completely stupefied by the unwonted exercise, and the air, and the drink which had been forced upon him, put his hand mechanically into that which Sykes extended for the purpose. "'Take his other hand, Toby,' said Sykes. "'Look out, Barney!' The man went to the door, and returned to announce that all was quiet. The two robbers issued forth with Oliver between them. Barney, having made all fast, rolled himself up as before, and was soon asleep again. It was now intensely dark. The fog was much heavier than it had been in the early part of the night, and the atmosphere was so damp that, although no rain fell, Oliver's hair and eyebrows, within a few minutes after leaving the house, had become stiff with the half-frozen moisture that was floating about. They crossed the bridge, and kept on towards the lights which he had seen before. They were at no great distance off, and as they walked pretty briskly, they soon arrived at Chertsey. "'Slap through the town,' whispered Sykes. "'There'll be nobody in the way to-night to see us.' Toby acquiesced, and they hurried through the main street of the little town, which at that late hour was wholly deserted. A dim light shone at intervals from some bedroom window, and the hoarse barking of dogs occasionally broke the silence of the night. But there was nobody abroad. They had cleared the town, as the church bell struck two. Quickening their pace, they turned up a road upon the left hand. After walking about a quarter of a mile, they stopped before a detached house surrounded by a wall, to the top of which Toby Crackett, scarcely pausing to take breath, climbed in a twinkling. "'The boy next,' said Toby. "'Hoist him up. I'll catch hold of him.' Before Oliver had time to look round, Sykes had caught him under the arms, and in three or four seconds he and Toby were lying on the grass on the other side. Sykes followed directly, and they stole cautiously towards the house. And now, for the first time, Oliver, well-nigh mad with grief and terror, saw that housebreaking and robbery, if not murder, were the objects of the expedition. He clasped his hands together, and involuntarily uttered a subdued exclamation of horror. A mist came before his eyes. The cold sweat stood upon his ashy face. His limbs failed him, and he sank upon his knees. "'Get up!' murmured Sykes, trembling with rage, and drawing the pistol from his pocket. "'Get up, or I'll strew your brains upon the grass!' "'Oh, for God's sake, let me go!' cried Oliver. "'Let me run away and die in the fields. I will never come near London. Never, never. Oh, pray, have mercy on me, and do not make me steal. For the love of all the bright angels as rest in heaven, have mercy upon me.' The man to whom this appeal was made, swore a dreadful oath, and had cocked the pistol, when Toby, striking it from his grasp, placed his hand upon the boy's mouth, and dragged him to the house. "'Hush!' cried the man. "'He won't answer here. Say another word, and I'll do your business myself, with a crack on the head. That makes no noise, and is quite as certain and more genteel. Here, Bill, winch the shutter open. He's game enough now, I'll engage. I've seen older hands of his age took the same way for a minute or two on a cold night." Sykes, invoking terrific imprecations upon Fagin's head for sending Oliver on such an errand, plied the crowbar vigorously, but with little noise. After some delay, and some assistance from Toby, the shutter to which he had referred swung open on its hinges. It was a little lattice window about five feet and a half above the ground at the back of the house, which belonged to a scullery or small brewing-place at the end of the passage. The aperture was so small that the inmates had probably not thought it worth while to defend it more securely, but it was large enough to admit a boy of Oliver's size, nevertheless. A very brief exercise of Mr. Sykes' art sufficed to overcome the fastening of the lattice, and it soon stood wide open also. "'Now, listen!' "'You young limb!' whispered Sykes, drawing a dark lantern from his pocket, and throwing the glare full on Oliver's face. 
I'm a going to put you through there. Take this light, go softly up the steps straight afore you, and along the little hall to the street door. Unfasten it and let us in. There's a bolt at the top you won't be able to reach, interposed Toby. Stand upon one of the old chairs. There are three there, Bill, with a jolly large blue unicorn and gold pitchfork on em, which is the old lady's arms. Keep quiet, can't you? replied Sykes with a threatening look. The room door is open, is it? Wide, replied Toby, after peeping in to satisfy himself. The game of that is that they always leave it open with a catch, so that the dog who's got a bed in here may walk up and down the passage when he feels wakeful. <laughs> Barney toised him away to-night. So neat. Although Mr. Crackett spoke in a scarcely audible whisper, and laughed without noise, Sykes imperiously commanded him to be silent, and to get to work. Toby complied, by first producing his lantern, and placing it on the ground, then by planting himself firmly with his head against the wall beneath the window, and his hands upon his knees, so as to make a step of his back. This was no sooner done, than Sykes, mounting upon him, put Oliver gently through the window with his feet first, and, without leaving hold of his collar, planted him safely on the floor inside. "'Take this lantern,' said Sykes, looking into the room. "'You see the stairs afore you?' Oliver, more dead than alive, gasped out, "'Yes!' Sykes, pointing to the street door with a pistol-barrel, briefly advised him to take notice that he was within shot all the way, and that if he faltered he would fall dead that instant. "'It's done in a minute,' said Sykes, in the same low whisper. "'Directly I leave go of you. Do your work.' "'Hark! What's that?' whispered the other man. They listened intently. "'Nothing,' said Sykes, releasing his hold of Oliver. "'Now!' In the short time he had had to collect his senses, the boy had firmly resolved that, whether he died in the attempt or not, he would make one effort to dart upstairs from the hall and alarm the family. Filled with this idea, he advanced at once, but stealthily. "'Come back!' suddenly cried Sykes aloud, "'Back! Back!' Scared by the sudden breaking of the dead stillness of the place, and by a loud cry which followed it, Oliver let his lantern fall, and knew not whether to advance or fly. The cry was repeated. A light appeared. A vision of two terrified half-dressed men at the top of the stairs swam before his eyes. A flash, a loud noise, a smoke, a crash somewhere, but where he knew not, and he staggered back. Sykes had disappeared for an instant, but he was up again, and had him by the collar before the smoke had cleared away. He fired his own pistol after the men, who were already retreating, and dragged the boy up. "'Clasp your arm tighter,' said Sykes, as he drew him through the window. "'Give me a shawl here. They've hit him. Quick! Now the boy bleeds!' Then came the loud ringing of a bell mingled with the noise of firearms, and the shouts of men, and the sensation of being carried over uneven ground at a rapid pace, and then the noises grew confused in the distance, and a cold, deadly feeling crept over the boy's heart, and he saw or heard no more. End of chapter 22「Chapter 23 of Oliver Twist – this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Mill Nicholson. Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens, Chapter 23. Which contains the substance of a pleasant conversation between Mr. Bumble and a lady, and shows that even a beadle may be susceptible on some points. The night was bitter cold. The snow lay on the ground, frozen into a hard, thick crust so that only the heaps that had drifted into byways and corners were affected by the sharp wind that howled abroad, which, as if expending increased fury on such prey as it found, caught it savagely up in clouds, and, whirling it into a thousand misty eddies, scattered it in air. Bleak, 
dark and piercing cold, it was a night for the well-housed and fed to draw round the bright fire, and thank God they were at home, and for the homeless, starving wretch to lay him down and die. Many hunger-worn outcasts close their eyes in our bare streets at such times, who, let their crimes have been what they may, can hardly open them in a more bitter world. Such was the aspect of out-of-doors affairs, when Mrs. Corney, the matron of the workhouse to which our readers have been already introduced as the birthplace of Oliver Twist, sat herself down before a cheerful fire in her own little room, and glanced, with no small degree of complacency, at a small round table, on which stood a tray of corresponding size, furnished with all necessary materials for the most grateful meal that matrons enjoy. In fact, Mrs. Corney was about to solace herself with a cup of tea. As she glanced from the table to the fireplace, where the smallest of all possible kettles was singing a small song in a small voice, her inward satisfaction evidently increased. So much so, indeed, that Mrs. Corney smiled. "'Well,' said the matron, leaning her elbow on the table, and looking reflectively at the fire, "'I'm sure we have all on us a great deal to be grateful for. A great deal, if we did but know it. Ha! <laughs> Mrs. Corney shook her head mournfully, as if deploring the mental blindness of those paupers who did not know it, and thrusting a silver spoon, private property, into the inmost recesses of a two-ounce tin tea-caddy, proceeded to make the tea. How slight a thing will disturb the equanimity of our frail minds! The black teapot, being very small and easily filled, ran over while Mrs. Corney was moralising and the water slightly scalded Mrs. Corney's hand. "'How oh, drat the pot!' said the worthy matron, setting it down very hastily on the hob. "'A little stupid thing, that only holds a couple of cups. What use is it of to anybody, except,' said Mrs. Corney, pausing, "'except to a poor, desolate creature like me. Oh, dear!' With these words the matron dropped into her chair, and once more resting her elbow on the table, thought of her solitary fate. The small teapot, and the single cup, had awakened in her mind sad recollections of Mr. Corney, who had not been dead more than five-and-twenty years, and she was overpowered. "'I shall never get another,' said Mrs. Corney, pettishly. "'I shall never get another like him.' Whether this remark bore reference to the husband or the teapot is uncertain. It might have been the latter for Mrs. Corney looked at it as she spoke, and took it up afterwards. She had just tasted her first cup, when she was disturbed by a soft tap at the room door. "'Oh, come in with you,' said Mrs. Corney sharply. "'Some of the old women dying, I suppose. They always die when I'm at meals. Don't stand there letting the cold air in, don't. What's amiss now, eh?' "'Nothing, ma'am, nothing,' replied a man's voice. "'Oh, dear me!' exclaimed the matron, in a much sweeter tone. "'Is that Mr. Bumble?' "'At your service, ma'am,' said Mr. Bumble, who had been stopping outside to rub his shoes clean, and to shake the snow off his coat, and who now made his appearance, bearing the cocked hat in one hand, and a bundle in the other. "'Shall I shut the door, ma'am?' The lady modestly hesitated to reply lest there should be any impropriety in holding an interview with Mr. Bumble with closed doors. Mr. Bumble, taking advantage of the hesitation, and being very cold himself, shut it without permission. "'Hard weather, Mr. Bumble,' said the matron. "'Hard indeed, ma'am,' replied the beadle. "'Any parochial weather this, ma'am. We have given away, Mrs. Corney, we have given away a matter of twenty quartern loaves and a cheese and a half, this very blessed afternoon. And yet them paupers are not contented." "'Of course not. When would they be, Mr. Bumble?' said the matron, sipping her tea. "'When indeed, ma'am,' rejoined Mr. Bumble. "'Why, he is one man that, in consideration of his wife and large family, has a quartern loaf and a good pound of cheese full weight. Is he grateful, ma'am? Is he grateful?' not a copper farthing's worth of it. What does he do, ma'am, but ask for a few coals? If it's only a pocket handkerchief full, he says. Coals? What would he do with coals? Toast his cheese with them, and then come back for more? 
"'That's the way with these people, ma'am. Give them an apron full of coals to-day, and they'll come back for another the day after to-morrow, as brazen as alabaster.' The matron expressed her entire concurrence in this intelligible simile, and the beadle went on. "'I never,' said Mr. Pumble, "'see anything like the pitch it's got to. The day afore yesterday, a man—you have been a married woman, ma'am, and I may mention it to you—a man, with hardly a rag upon his back—here Mrs. Corney looked at the floor—goes to our overseer's door, when he has got company coming to dinner, and says he must be relieved, Mrs. Corney. As he wouldn't go away, and shocked the company very much, our overseer sent him out a pound of potatoes and half a pint of oatmeal. "'My heart,' says the ungrateful villain, "'what's the use of this to me? You might as well give me a pair of iron spectacles.' "'Very good,' says our overseer, taking them away again. "'You won't get anything else here. Then I'll die in the streets,' says the vagrant. "'Oh, no, you won't,' says our overseer. <laughs> oh, that was very good. So like Mr. Granite, wasn't it? interposed the matron. Well, Mr. Pample. Well, ma'am, rejoined the beadle, he went away, and he did die in the streets. There's an obstinate pauper before you. It beats anything I could have believed, observed the matron emphatically. But don't you think out-of-door relief a very bad thing anyway, Mr. Pample? You're a gentleman of experience, and ought to know. Come." "'Mrs. Corney,' said the beadle, smiling as men smile, who are conscious of superior information, "'out of door relief, properly managed, properly managed, ma'am, is the parochial safeguard. The great principle of out of door relief is to give the paupers exactly what they don't want, and then they get tired of coming.' "'Dear me!' exclaimed Mrs. Corney. Well, <laughs> that is a good one, too. Yes, betwixt you and me, ma'am, returned Mr. Bumble, that's the great principle, and that's the reason why, if you look at any cases that get into them audacious newspapers, you'll always observe that sick families have been relieved with slices of cheese. That's the rule now, Mrs. Corney, all over the country. But however, said the beadle, stopping to unpack his bundle. These are official secrets, ma'am, not to be spoken of, except, as I may say, among the parochial officers, such as ourselves. This is the port wine, ma'am, that the board ordered for the infirmary. Real, fresh, genuine port wine. Only out of the cask this forenoon. Clear as a bell, no sediment. Having held the first bottle up to the light, and shaken it well to test its excellence, Mr. Bumble placed them both on top of a chest of drawers, folded the handkerchief in which they had been wrapped, put it carefully in his pocket, and took up his hat as if to go. "'You'll have a very cold walk, Mr. Bumble,' said the matron. "'It blows, ma'am,' replied Mr. Bumble, turning up his coat-collar, "'enough to cut one's ears off.' The matron looked from the little kettle to the beadle, who was moving towards the door, and as the beadle coughed, preparatory to bidding her good-night, bashfully inquired whether—whether whether he wouldn't take a cup of tea. Mr. Bumble instantaneously turned back his collar again, laid his hat and stick upon a chair, and drew another chair up to the table. As he slowly seated himself, he looked at the lady. She fixed her eyes upon the little teapot. Mr. Bumble coughed again, and slightly smiled. Mrs. Corney rose to get another cup and saucer from the closet. As she sat down, her eyes once again encountered those of the gallant beadle. She coloured, and applied herself to the task of making his tea. Again Mr. Bumble coughed, louder this time than he had coughed yet. "'Sweet, Mr. Bumble?' inquired the matron, taking up the sugar-basin. "'Very sweet indeed, ma'am,' replied Mr. Bumble. He fixed his eyes on Mrs. Corney as he said this and if ever a beadle looked tender, Mr. Bumble was that beadle at that moment. The tea was made, and handed in silence, Mr. Bumble having spread a handkerchief over his knees to prevent the crumbs from sullying the splendour of his shorts, began to eat and drink, 
varying these amusements occasionally by fetching a deep sigh, which, however, had no injurious effect upon his appetite, but, on the contrary, rather seemed to facilitate his operations in the tea and toast department. "'You have a cat, ma'am, I see,' said Mr. Bumble, glancing at one who, in the centre of her family, was basking before the fire. "'And kittens, too, I declare.' "'I am so fond of them, Mr. Bumble. You can't think,' replied the matron. "'They're so happy, so frolicsome, and so cheerful, that they are quite companions for me.' "'Very nice animals, ma'am,' replied Mr. Bumble approvingly. "'So very domestic.' "'Oh, yes,' rejoined the matron with enthusiasm. "'So fond of their home, too. That is quite a pleasure, I'm sure.' "'Mrs. Corney, ma'am,' said Mr. Bumble, slowly, and marking the time with his spoon, "'I mean to say this, ma'am, that any cat, or kitten, that could live with you, ma'am, and not be fond of its home, must be a ass, ma'am.' "'Oh, Mr. Bumble,' remonstrated Mrs. Corney. "'It's of no use disguising facts, ma'am,' said Mr. Bumble slowly flourishing the teaspoon with a kind of amorous dignity which made him doubly impressive. "'I would drown it myself, with pleasure.' "'Then you're a cruel man,' said the matron vivaciously, as she held out her hand for the beadle's cup. "'And a very hard-hearted man besides.' "'Hard-hearted, ma'am,' said Mr. Bumble. "'Hard?' Mr. Bumble resigned his cup without another word squeezed Mrs. Corney's little finger as she took it, and, inflicting two open-handed slaps upon his laced waistcoat, gave a mighty sigh, and hitched his chair a very little morsel farther from the fire. It was a round table, and as Mrs. Corney and Mr. Bumble had been sitting opposite each other, with no great space between them, and fronting the fire, it will be seen that Mr. Bumble, in receding from the fire, and still keeping at the table, increased the distance between himself and Mrs. Corney, which proceeding some prudent readers will doubtless be disposed to admire, and to consider an act of great heroism on Mr. Bumble's part, he being in some sort tempted by time, place, and opportunity to give utterance to certain soft nothings, which, however well they may have become the lips of the light and thoughtless, do seem immeasurably beneath the dignity of judges of the land, members of Parliament, ministers of state, lord mayors, and other great public functionaries, but more particularly beneath the stateliness and gravity of a beadle, who, as is well known, should be the sternest and most inflexible among them all. Whatever were Mr. Bumble's intentions, however, and no doubt they were of the best, it unfortunately happened, as has been twice before remarked, that the table was a round one. Consequently, Mr. Bumble, moving his chair by little and little, soon began to diminish the distance between himself and the matron, and, continuing to travel round the outer edge of the circle, brought his chair, in time, close to that in which the matron was seated. Indeed, the two chairs touched, and when they did so, Mr. Bumble stopped. Now, if the matron had moved her chair to the right, she would have been scorched by the fire and if to the left, she must have fallen into Mr. Bumble's arms. So, being a discreet matron, and no doubt foreseeing these consequences at a glance, she remained where she was, and handed Mr. Bumble another cup of tea. "'Hard-hearted, Mrs. Corney,' said Mr. Bumble, stirring his tea and looking up into the matron's face. "'Are you hard-hearted, Mrs. Corney?' "'Dear me!' exclaimed the matron. "'What a very curious question from a single man! What can you want to know for, Mr. Bumble?' The beadle drank his tea to the last drop, finished a piece of toast, whisked the crumbs off his knees, wiped his lips, and deliberately kissed the matron. "'Mr. Bumble!' cried that discreet lady in a whisper, for the fright was so great that she had quite lost her voice. "'Mr. Bumble! I shall scream!' Mr. Bumble made no reply, but in a slow and dignified manner put his arm round the matron's waist. As the lady had stated her intention of screaming, 
of course she would have screamed at this additional boldness, but that the exertion was rendered unnecessary by a hasty knocking at the door, which was no sooner heard than Mr. Bumble darted with much agility to the wine-bottles, and began dusting them with great violence, while the matron sharply demanded who was there. It is worthy of remark, as a curious physical instance of the efficacy of a sudden surprise in counteracting the effects of extreme fear, that her voice had quite recovered all its official asperity. "'If you please, mistress,' said a withered old female pauper, hideously ugly, putting her head in the door, "'Old Sally is a-going fast.' "'Well, what's that to me?' angrily demanded the matron. "'I can't keep her alive, can I?' "'No, no, mistress,' replied the old woman. "'Nobody can. She's far beyond the reach of help. I've seen a many people die, little babes and great strong men, and I know when deaths are coming well enough. But she's troubled in her mind, and when the fits are not on her, and that's not often, for she's dying very hard, she says she has got something to tell which you must hear.' she'll never die quiet till you come mistress at this intelligence the worthy mrs corney muttered a variety of invectives against old women who couldn't even die without purposely annoying their betters and muffling herself in a thick shawl which she hastily caught up briefly requested mr bumble to stay till she came back lest anything particular should occur bidding the messenger walk fast and not be all night hobbling up the stairs she followed her from the room with a very ill grace, scolding all the way. Mr. Bumble's conduct on being left to himself was rather inexplicable. He opened the closet, counted the teaspoons, weighed the sugar-tongs, closely inspected a silver milk-pot to ascertain that it was of the genuine metal, and, having satisfied his curiosity on these points, put on his cocked hat corner-wise, and danced with much gravity four distinct times round the table. Having gone through this very extraordinary performance, he took off the cocked hat again, and, spreading himself before the fire, with his back towards it, seemed to be mentally engaged in taking an exact inventory of the furniture. End of chapter 23